Anyway, sir, we are still in the Sonoran Desert, uh, you know, pretty close to the Mexican border, but about 7,500 feet up, and uh, that's why we're in a conifer forest right now. Now, you can see over there, you got uh, a nice wildfire, which burned pretty good, and you can expect to see more of that as you get more people into these wild areas, hashtag wanderlust. Uh, you know, I'm probably responsible for bringing more people out here, but just don't be an asshole if you do come. Uh, and then, uh, of course, it's climate change ramps up. Now, I know some of the obsolete racist grandpas who are watching right now don't really like climate change. It triggers them. It makes them, uh, I guess it just portrays a view of the world that they're not comfortable with. But just, you know, know that I still got a place in my heart for you. You know, I'll give you a massage or something. You know, even if you want to talk uh, about some silly shit about how water vapor causes climate change, uh, which it doesn't because when you reach a level of water vapor in the atmosphere, uh, at a certain point, uh, it just... Uh, precipitates out in the form of rain, which some of you might be familiar with, rain. Uh, anyway, uh, let's take a look at this uh, Sudasuga menziesii, Doug fir. So we're high enough now, we're in a Doug fir zone. This is a, you know, a pretty moisture demanding tree as far as conifers go. You know, it's uh, a lot of the pines are a lot more, uh, a lot more drought tolerant, like this uh, Pinus englemanii, uh, Apache pine. It's called needles in fascicula three, and uh, they're somewhat long. So you always got to pay attention to how many needles you got in a bundle called a fascicle uh, when you're looking at the pines if you don't have a cone. You know, ideally, you know, like any plant, you want reproductive structures to identify what the shit you're looking at. But sometimes with the, the pines, you don't got them, you know. Sometimes they're just too rotten or they're decomposing or the squirrels drag them off, you know. So anyway, got a lot of nice pines going on here. Uh, you got Pinus sombroides uh, I just seen down the road. It's a really beautiful uh species of Mexican pinion pine. Now let's take a look what we got going on here over with the uh, the smaller herbaceous stuff, okay? Now look at this, uh, look at this lupin. You'll notice it's wilting. Why could that be? Why do you think that lupin is wilting? It might have to do with that tailing pile of dirt uh, poking out the ground right there. You could tell some little gopher just went down there and, uh, you know, ate this guy's root, severed his connection, you know, to his, uh, his his roots and his moisture supply and food supply, and so now he's dying. So little gophers, kind of funny. Up here you got one of my favorites, Silene luciniata, Karyophyllales. And uh, it's the real build. That's what luciniate means, is it means fringe. You know, so like all those uh, horrible, ugly leather jackets with the fringe on them that people wore in the 80s with their mullets and bad cologne and shit, uh, that, those could be called luciniate. Not sure what you would call the people that chose to wear that kind of uh, heinous shit, but uh, regardless, you know, to each his own. What you want to pay attention to down here is uh, that thick tuberous taproot, which uh, acts as a little battery. It's the perennial rhizo. Now, of course, we're at 7,500 feet. It does freeze and get uh, uh, cold as balls here in the winter. So the above ground tissue dies. This is a perennial, but the above ground tissue dies. And so it relies on that, that root down there, which is basically just a little battery. You can see how thick it is filled with uh, carbohydrates and moisture you know, in the water and so that's what it taps into this plant taps into when it's coming back in the spring and the temperatures warm up and what the shit rock seems to be a, some kind of volcanic probably a rhyolite it could be oh no it's not that's definitely volcanic oh yeah so uh oh then you got down here a thelictrum which never gets uh, enough appreciation oh what's this is that another type of lomation APACA. So remember that feathery leaves and the, you know, an umbel, that type of flower is called an umbel. It's just basically, it's an inflorescence, a bunch of tiny flowers uh, composed into one, but it's uh, shaped like an umbrella that got uh, blown up by a storm. You know, it got flipped upside down by harsh winds, which is how I remember uh, umbel, you know, or at least well, I used to years ago when I was first learning this shit, and you should, you should do it too. An umbel. A lot of different uh, plants, uh, genera of plants have an umbel inflorescence, you know, Ariagonum, uh, a lot of shit in the APACA, etc. Let's take a look down here at this uh, Thelictrum, though, because I wanted to show you, and the, 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 the Thelictrums never get uh, enough respect, you know, because they're so, they're just too dainty, you know, they're too goddamn dainty, uh, but uh, regardless, they're a cool plant. Look at those goddamn stamens, just uh, those pendant stamens just hanging out the flower right there. There's the leaves. And this is in a ranunculaceae, if you believe that. The anemone family. All right, well, let's, uh, let's go up the road a little bit, see what else we got. Okay, so standing at the base of this Apache pine, you can look up there, you can see some funny shit going on in the trunk. Those bright orange coral-like nodules 
uh, sticking out about a foot. Uh, that's a species of Archithobium. The whole genus Archithobium uh, are known as the pine mistletoes. They occur in pine and juniper. Uh, the whole family, the whole genus parasitizes members of the Pinaceae, the pine family, and the redwood family slash juniper family, Cupressaceae. Uh, they're in the Santalaceae, which is the, the family. Uh, the whole Santalaceae family is uh, parasitic, but they're some of the less showy mistletoes. Now, mistletoe, of course, is a common name. It can refer to many unrelated plants. For example, you got also got the tropical mistletoes, uh, also known as the showy mistletoes. Those are in a family, uh, Laurent, they see, and they got real nice flowers. You see those in Mexico a lot. Uh, but uh, regardless, Archithobium, uh, you can see it's mostly yellow. It's mostly just completely parasitizing that plant. It doesn't really produce too much of its own chlorophyll, uh, and it doesn't photosynthesize too much of its own energy uh, like the other genus in its family, Phorodendron, do. You'll see Phorodendron in a lot of oak trees in California and what the shit, maybe down there in the south, too. Uh, regardless, interesting thing about Archithobium is uh, I think its berries might be dispersed by birds, but the, the, primary, the primary dispersal mechanism for plants in this genus is an explosive dehiscence. That is, the plant will actually uh, shoot seeds out. You know, sometimes it speeds upwards of 50 miles per hour, and that's how a tree can be so heavily infested. You know, I mean, it's just, you could see numerous different plants on the entire tree. There's probably, this thing's probably covered in 40 different individual uh, Archithobium, whatever species this is. You can see just multiple different plants. And what they do basically is the seeds have a, a jelly-like substance on them and a, a mucilaginous substance, you know, like someone blew their nose. And it uh, helps the seed adhere to the branches and uh, at which point when uh, conditions are uh, ripe for germination, uh, the seed will send out a hostoria and, and drill. I guess, I don't know drill if is the right word, but either way, it just penetrates into that root tissue. Hostoria is just a word uh, for a parasitic root. And, uh, you know, any parasite can have them, whether it's plants in the Orobancaceae, terrestrial parasites, or uh, epiphytic parasites, uh, such as those in the Santalaceae, uh, like this, and the Laurentaceae. You know, and, and these plants, they'll, uh, they don't knock the tree back too much, but if you get a lot of them, if you get a lot of these bastards in there, you know, they could, uh, they could lead the forest decline, especially if trees are already compromised by uh, smog or some of those... Uh, uh, other uh, pollutants in the atmosphere that come from auto exhaust or once again climate change that is just longer uh, longer intervals uh, in between precipitation events sorry grandpa i'll give you a massage don't worry about it i still love you i still love you all right I'm not trying to trigger you make you mad you just got to bring that up it is a it is a factual science going on right now hope it doesn't bother you i'm sorry i'll send you some cookies or some shit anyway there you go there's archithobium Okay, there we go. Look at this beautiful bastard. Look at those leaves, okay? But more importantly, look at those flowers. So tell me, what what family you think this guy might be in? Huh? What family? Smells pretty good. He's got numerous stamens. And if you look at the flowers, uh, he's got uh, five distinct uh, petals. You can't really see it too, too well right there, I guess. But, uh, you know, so but those numerous stamens really give it away. And the five distinct petals. If you guess rose family, rosaceae, they'd be right. This is a species of cercocarpus, also known as the mountain mahoganies. Very, uh, very wonderful smelling plant. I could smell it from here. Ah, you got a species of pinion pine up there, some yucca. And this plant, that is a beaut. And unfortunately, since it flowers at night, we just missed it. Let's take a look at one of the ones down here, though. There you go. You can see the flowers basically just the finished finished up and that's because these pollinate at night they're white flowers uh is actually you know what maybe these maybe these didn't go off yet these ones went off yet anyway they're, they're white flowers and many of course large tubular white flowered flowers that you see whether it's the tura or brugmansia or some of the cactus flowers of course since they're white you could tell they're probably pollinated at night since white would be the, the most uh, attractive uh, visual uh, pigment or lack of pigments to have uh, to attract pollinators in a pitch black. Uh, this is Mirabilis longiflora and it's uh, pollinated by a species, primarily by a species of sphinx moth, 
the various bees and shit will steal nectar uh, from the base right there where the nectar is produced. And this thing isn't actually even producing nectar during the day. It starts to produce, uh, the, starts to, the nectar starts to flow later on in the evening when the sphinx moths are out and these flowers open. Again, they open for one night and one night only. But uh, you could have, you know, the same plant could be flowering, uh, different parts of the same plant could be flowering at different uh, different nights. You know, so maybe this will flower on Monday night, this will go off on Tuesday, etc., Wednesday with this shit. Actually, it looks like, yeah, many of these didn't even, uh, they're not even, the, the flowers aren't even ready yet. This one's going to go off tonight. You can see that guy right there. And these are species, these are pollinated by species of moth called the, God, I forget the name, Mimduca, Kinky Sisifolia or some shit. Kinky something. There's something kinky going on with this, I don't know, but it's a beautiful species of sphinx moth. Up here, we got a real nice member of the, uh, oh, look at it, it's a Comalinaceae, either a Comalina or a Tradescantia. The Wandering Jews. Very Rabinowitz and the Wandering Jews. Real nice name for a band. You guys can have that. Anyone wants to steal that name, you know, start, a, start a Hebrew band or something, be, be my guest, you know. It's not copyrighted. Anyway, here's a... Here's uh, Echianda flavescens, and this is a member of the uh, agave family, if you could believe that. Uh, it's, I guess, you know, the taxonomy and all these is messed up. Some people group it into agavaceae, which I like. And then, of course, uh, that being in the larger agavaceae, being nested within the larger asparagales order. Some people uh, like the uh, just throw this in an agave subfamily of the larger asparagaceae family. But uh, for all intents and purposes, let's just consider Asparagales the order and uh, consider this in the agave subfamily. Along with true agaves and uh, desert lilies. And uh, that uh, there's a real nice species up there in uh, northeastern California uh, that's got the uh, Leuco Leucocrinums, the genus. Anyway, regardless, let's take a look at what's going on with the flowers. You can see uh, being a monocot, it's got six stamens. Remember, multiples of three since it's a monocot. Uh, it's got that uh, very pronounced and uh, curved uh, style coming out there, that female part, which, of course, is longer than the stamens, uh, reduce the chances of self-pollination. And then, uh, importantly, too, as you can tell, you know, if you ever confuse these with, with the lilies, which they're certainly not, but uh, you want to say you're, you're thinking about doing it, you think I'm going to, you know, call this a lily, Again, it's not a lily at all, but some of these plants were grouped into the lily family for a while. You could just look at that bract right there. See that bract that's subtending that flower right there? Just basically that little kind of transparent thing that looks like a, a tapered piece of tape on the, uh, the underside of that, uh, where that flower's coming out on this uh, flower spike. All the members of uh, the agave family have that little bract. And some of the, a lot of the orchids do too. They have those little bricks, but orchids, of course, are in the same order as agaves, that being the asparagales. Well, asparagales is a wonderful order of monocots. A lot of good shit going on, a lot of diversity. You can see this guy's coming up in a uh, in a in some of the bunch grasses, but down here, you can see there's his uh, his basal rosetta leaves. Oh yeah, look at that a wonderful parallel venation and the, that blue tinge to it. Oh, are you trying to get in there and get some pollinators or what? Again, it's Echianda flavescens. Echiandia, sorry. Sometimes I forget how many vowels are in there. So anyway, we're up here now at about 8,000 feet. You know, it's real nice up here. You just got to get high. Still in the Sonoran Desert, but we're in a sky island about a mile and a half up. So that's why the temperature is pretty pleasant right now. And it's why you have this little riparian area. Uh, it's basically probably just old snow melt. Uh, it's still in the ground. The snow's all gone, but of course there's still moisture in the ground and it's slowly percolating uh, into the drainage and out into the basin uh, eventually. I'd like to show you the species of Asteraceae. Uh, due to the globos head and uh, the basal rosetta leaves and its habit of growing in a riparian area, I'm going to guess this is a species of Helenium. I might be wrong on that. No way to check at the moment, but I'm guessing it's a species of Helenium. Look at these uh, very glabrous and smooth uh, leaves over there and again you mostly uh, have a basal rosette you got you do have some call line leaves you got some leaves on a stem but it's mostly basal and uh, they're you know somewhat succulent feel pretty nice you got a whole a bunch of ferns going on right there and uh, you got a five needled pine over there probably a pinus pseudostrobus right there and get up there you could just tell it's five needled because uh, 
since there's more needles per fascicle, it tends to have more of like a brush, a brush appearance. Uh, right there, I believe that's just the good old Apache pine, pine of single money. And then since there are so many pines up here, again, we do have uh, a species of mycorrhizal uh, Basidiomycete fungus. Remember, fungi, at least the mushrooms as you conventionally think of them, are generally either ascomycetes or basidiomycetes. Basidiomycetes are just the ones that have a, a stem and cap. And uh, this is a species uh, in the uh, Boletaceae. Again, you can tell that because it's got those pores right there, possibly a Sulis or a Bolete. Uh, you know, I wish I'd spent more time uh, paying attention and taking notes when Alan would tell me all this shit because the guy's like a goddamn encyclopedia of mushrooms. Alan Rockefeller, look that guy up. Real, real nice guy, wonderful man, friend of mine. Uh, he's down in Mexico all the time. Uh, you know, he's trying to write a book on mushrooms in Mexico, and I just love him down there. Uh, you know, he's super friendly down to educate people. Uh, anyway, he's a... Uh, anyway, so yeah, there you go. It's a Basulis or a Boletus of some kind. I don't know what this shit... Uh, it's decomposing up there, so it smells pretty bad. I'm going to go ahead and let that go. You can see it just... Uh, it's all those spores just... Ugh. But uh, again, these are mycorrhizal with uh, pines and oaks. So wherever you got uh, pine and oak trees, you're going to have a species of Bolete. And if you have oaks, you're certainly going to have a species of Amanita as well. Uh, some of the Amanitas are deadly, some uh, are quite choice. Uh, let's, uh, let's take a look, see what else we got down there. Now, now this is really fascinating. I'm, this is, this is, uh, this is something else. Apparently somebody was here and they went and uh, harvested a bunch of mushrooms, but they didn't take them. You can see there's the Amanita muscaria right there. Uh, there's, uh, just a whole variety of bolites, Amanitas, uh, possibly some gallerinas, some, uh, Agaricaceae family members, et cetera, and what the shit. And then uh, if you come over here and you look, I mean, this is a, this is prime evidence of uh, the organism that I'm thinking of. You know, they like to do this. It's a, it's kind of like a larger size of a pack rat, man. This is a, this is evidence, this is evidence of hippies. This is evidence of hippies. There's no doubt about it. Undoubtedly, the hippies were here. I'm not sure what they were doing. They were piling stuff around, you know, to making a mess. Uh, you know, there's probably various essential oils, uh, were here and present. I think the dogs can still get a whiff of them. Uh, something was going on. Something was going on. But as you can see, uh, they've already departed the area. They're, they're, they tend to be a migratory species. They never stay in one place too long, but they certainly were here. I mean, this is undoubtedly, this is evidence of hippies, you know. And there was, uh, probably talk about uh, astrology, uh, moon cycles, uh, uh, solstice events, the next plane solstice events, things like that. This is uh, undoubtedly, there were hippies here. Okay, let's go on. I'm looking for a pretty rare species of Asclepius in the remnants of this, uh, this burned forest over here. Let's see what we can find on here. Okay, so uh, you can see uh, the invasive mullen is nowhere around, which is a good thing because mullen uh, is a pretty obnoxious plant. It's not native and it spreads like wildfire. Uh, and especially it tends to come up after wildfire, after a great disturbance. Uh, it kind of, you know, takes advantage of that, that niche. It's an opportunist and then gets established and outcompetes natives. And I don't see it here. So that makes me think even more so. I mean, there's a stock of it right there. But it does make me think that the hippies were indeed here, which is good. That's the hippies can have a positive effect on ecosystems, especially if they're into herbalism and, and that kind of goofy stuff, they tend to, uh, you know, to come out here and to take all of the mullen. And uh, it's, they're basically doing, by, har by over-harvesting mullen, hopefully they get all of it. You should always rip mullen out. If you're in North America, rip mullen out wherever you can. Just grab by the stock and rip it out. Maybe the hippies took it and they were using it for, you know, uh, potions. Uh, potions, they, they smoke it. They, you know, tinctures for their ass, whatever. Regardless, they do help eradicate uh, that really horrible non-native invasive species mullen in the genus verbascum but uh, that the uh, milkweed i wanted to, that I, wanted, I was looking for is not here i mean it's here but it's not flowering here's a species of it this is asclepius hypoluca and it's uh, notable for having almost blood red flowers beautiful uh beautiful corollas beautiful gynostegium with the hoods and what the shit the hoods are red everything's red maroon and pink and these real nice colors but it's not the it's just, I don't see it going off, you know. It's not going off. I've seen a couple more up there, but they were missing their flowers. It could have been hippies as well. Unlikely, though, since I don't believe 
uh, hippies think milkweed is, quote, good for anything. I don't think there's anything you could do. I think if you put the milkweed in your ass, you're probably just going to come down with a bad rash or something. But, you know, some people are into that, so who knows. Uh, regardless, I'm going to keep looking for it. I really hope I get to see this goddamn Asclepius because it's a somewhat rare species only known from southern Arizona and uh, in northern Mexico, I believe. All right, there we go. Everybody be careful because they, they still could be in an area up in the trees and shit. You know, if there's, I don't know if they got some white people with dreadlocks up there or what, but you never know. Uh, but the, the, here is Asclepius hypoluca. You know, and again, I don't think they're coming for it. I think I'm safe, but just in case, uh, you got to take precautions. Anyway, let's take a look at this Corolla right there. Uh, it's notable for indeed having a, a, a blood red Corolla. It's utterly gorgeous. Abaxial surface is a, quite tomatose and fuzzy again it's just like a you got the like the the ass paper thing going on here really smooth really lovely uh, of course uh, if you take this and use it as an ass wipe you are an asshole you would be an asshole you probably don't want to do it anyways because you got that secondary chemistry and those cardiac glycosides in there that might give you a uh, some uh, contact dermatitis and what the shit uh, including that milk milky latex so uh, you got a red stem uh, above ground tissue is a deciduous of course it dies back every year but in, deep in the ground you got a nice uh, perennial rhizome and then a uh, you know uh, voluminous fuzz all all up and down the stem nice and then again that corolla that corolla is just i mean it's something else you know and i've been i've been lurking on some milkweeds lately you know i just they're they're gorgeous they really woo me and uh there's no pollinators look at it let's look at that stigmatic slit Look at this stigmatic slit. This, look at this, this fly thinks you're just going to pollinate that. You're yeah, right, buddy. That stigmatic slit would eat you alive. All right. So let's take a look here at this, uh, this Corolla. Oh, yeah. Look at it. So only a couple of those flowers have opened in that umble. But uh, the top of the gynostegium, the disc up there is white. You got the stigmatic. It's so dark. It's such a beautiful burgundy color. You can't even see in there. Oh, yeah. There's the stigmatic slit. So those are five things pointing up. Of course, those are the horns. I did a nice video on milkweed pollination. You should watch if you give a shit. Uh, they got a pretty cryptic and weird uh, pollination strategy. All the uh, sexy parts are enclosed in that gynostegium, which is that column uh, beneath that white uh, disc right there. It's the gynostegium. The petals, of course, are reflexed. Uh, the, the hoods are those pokey things. And uh, Do they even have any horns? I don't even think they have any horns. They might have horns. Horns are just basically like what I said. They're little uh, spike-shaped horn-looking things that poke out of those uh, inner chambers on those hoods. I don't even see any horns. Maybe they're just real subtle. Uh, regardless, look at that goddamn flower. That is, I mean, this is, and again, this is a somewhat rare plant, you know? It's, it, it, it's in a... Uh, you know, a lot of the sky islands, of course, but again, it's a high altitude species and there's only so many places you can grow. So this this guy's landlocked there. It's not like he's going to get dispersed uh, anywhere else very far away. He's uh, he's up here at 8,000 feet in the sky islands of the Chiricahua Mountains and uh, just growing in the understory beneath a beneath bunch of uh, Pinus pseudostrobus and Pinus angomaniae and shit in a... Look, he's still looking out for the hippies. Did you see any, Jack? Did you see none? No? No no dreadlocks, huh? All right. What a wonderful goddamn... Who doesn't love milkweeds? If you don't love milkweeds, I'm going to have to go ahead and say you're an asshole. Again, Asclepius hypoluca. Uh, so, anyway, you can see I'm getting pissed on now. The weather's changed a little bit. It must be those summer monsoons that come up from the south. Uh, sometimes in the form of chubascos, uh, sometimes just as a, a higher altitude precipitation. But you can see, uh, it's hard to leave this uh, beautiful Asclepius hypoluca. Look at that wonderful uh, umbel right there. Just a, just a color you don't normally see in a milkweed. A beautiful uh, red and uh, pink, all kinds of, you know, shit. Looks like a nice burgundy blush. How about that? Huh? And this is a, you know... There's a, a, what appears to be a, a nice little colony of them here. You know, Lou, you're being really good. I'm really proud of you. Uh, maybe we'll go back to the truck over there, but uh, it's about a mile up the hill. So, uh, gotta get you a little dog umbrella or something. 
Uh, anyway, uh, you know, uh, normally I don't mind getting pissed on, but the uh, recording equipment and what the shit that it might be a problem if it gets wet. Uh, also, my truck's got a, starting to get a flat tire. But let's uh, let's look more. Uh, get up in there and look at this uh, this beautiful milkweed. I mean, you know, normally you, you see a milkweed, you get a little bit of pinks, maybe some whites, maybe a yellow or an orange in the, in the case of a tuberosa, uh, which uh, occurs down here too, which is kind of odd. We normally think it's like a eastern species, but tuberosa is down here. But uh, there you can clearly see, I mean, it's just... There's variations on a theme, you know. Endless forms most beautiful in what the shit. Oh, we're getting some thunder too. And yeah, maybe I should go in. I think it's it. I think we're gonna start getting some lightning. And then just a drastic taper off down there, uh, looking down slope. And you can see the fire didn't quite burn this. Oh yeah, the umbrella's starting to leak too. Okay, I'm gonna go inside. But hopefully, uh, hopefully you enjoy that beautiful plant right there. Beautiful plant. Some uh, mullen that the hippies missed. I'm gonna have to rip that out of my way out. Anyway, here's a pretty interesting one. This is stevia, and I believe it's a uh, stevia plumeray. And yes, it's uh, in the same genus as the stevia that you uh, put in your uh, in your coffee, or you know, hopefully you're doing that instead of using that aspartame shit or real sugar. You know, because it just the, the fucking glycemic index on those things is awful. Plus, the aspartame fucks up your stomach flora. Anyway, uh, regardless, here's a uh, uh, stevia plumeray and you can see it's got tiny flowers now you can confuse these with another genus in the aster family the sunflower family which this is a member of uh, called agratina except the corollas on this on these stevias tend to be much larger but you still got the same uh, general thing going on look at those little bug antennas those styles poking out of the individual florets now the thing with stevias is each capitula tends to have about four or five uh, individual uh, florets in it so uh, let's look up close right there. See, it's got about four and maybe a fifth immature one in there. So, uh, oh, wait, this is another. See, this other capitula didn't even open. It's got one floor. It's starting to open. One's open and then it's sort of. But you get the you get the gist of what's going on. Basically, tiny flowers with the uh, wide corolla lobes. Oh, look at those little uh, plumos. Is that the papus sticking out? Those little red things? Anyway, uh, you know, so you got the four to four to five florets per capitula, and then of course uh, uh, wide corolla lobes with a big style in there. Again, it's sunflower family Asteraceae. Flowers are discoid. There's no ray flowers, and uh, I, I forget how many species are. In, it's a big ass genus. The one that you put in your in your coffee and shit, and if if you drink that sevia so, uh, soda or whatever the fuck it's called, that is from Brazil. I forget the species name, but it's a a uh, little bit larger of a shrub. I believe they're all pretty much uh, perennials, sub shrubs to shrubs. Some get upwards of 10 or 12 feet tall. So, uh, you know, the rain's just been coming uh, in waves, basically, intermittent waves. It'll rain for 10 minutes, you know, get pretty hard, then stop. And, uh, you know, it's not too bad. I'm enjoying it. I'm not I'm not soaked yet. Oh, yeah, there, there you go. There's a beautiful uh, species of Amanita, probably Amanita muscaria. There's another one popping off. Now, Amanitas, everything in the genus Amanita, is mycorrhizal with pines and oaks. And it's being called ectomycorrhizal. It is, uh, they uh, basically ensheath, the fungi ensheaths the roots. The other type of mycorrhizae is called AM mycorrhizae. That stands for arbuscular mycorrhizae because they form arbuscules uh, inside the roots. Basically, they're, they're also called endo. AM fungi, arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, are, are also called uh, endo mycorrhizal fungi because they basically penetrate uh, the cortical cells uh, of the roots right there so they go in there and uh, you know they just it, most of the the endomycorrhizae do not produce mushrooms like this too they're mostly you know the glomeromycota and some of those uh, clads of fungi but the basidiomycetes uh, are definitely ectomycorrhizal that is they uh, basically like I said ensheath the root in a you know this chanterelles are one uh uh bolites are one and then of course uh these the amanitas are another type of ectomycorrhizal basidiomycete fungi remember basidiomycete just means they they got the cap they got the cap in a stem typical toadstool shape and you look at these these are another uh, diagnostic factor for a lot of amanitas uh, i forget what you would call these because i'm no goddamn mycologist and i uh should have paid attention harder when my friends that were were telling me, but you get these, basically these look like little uh, 
uh, you know, kind of like a pizza crust, uh, panaderia, uh, sweetbread type shits on the top of the cap. Those little white things. Maybe somebody knows what that is. They can leave it in the comments below or what the shit. Uh, and of course, unlike the bolis, these have true gills. Uh, if I could rip this up out of the ground, which I guess I'll do. You know, it's not harming the fungi by ripping it up. Oh yeah, see, they got an angelus. They got an annulus, and they got a vulva on there, which is the little egg they come out of. You can see uh, there's all the gills which disperse the spores. You can even see that gill structure on the outside. Supposedly, you can nibble on these, and it'll just put your ass to sleep, make you feel a little goofy, at least on this species, muscaria. Though I wouldn't recommend it, but I've heard you can. Uh, of course, you got to be careful. Some of the species in this genus are deadly poisonous, and uh, there's no coming back once you re reach uh, the critical point of... Uh, toxicity you know you, you basically lose your liver you need a new liver but they're just the overall beautiful look at it look at that that stem look at that stipe just beautiful beautiful architecture endless forms most beautiful that flaking just a gorgeous goddamn mus mushroom and again they uh they basically got a symbiotic thing going on with these pines you know the pines uh the pines uh, give them a little bit of carbohydrates and sugars that they create in photosynthesis. And the fungi helps the pines and the oaks uh, grab some of that phosphorus that's in the soil. They got enzymes. The fungus has enzymes that can help digest some of the other shit that's in the soil, break it down. You know, they do a swap. They do a handoff. It's a, it's a pretty uh, wonderful relationship they got going on. Oh, yeah. There's that rain again. Thought I could put this crappy umbrella away, but... Uh, it turns out I was wrong. Anyway, it's nice. It smells pretty good. Here's a plant I really like. I want to show you. You get a lot of diversity in this genus in Mexico, but uh, it's not often that you see it in the United States. It just comes in to the U.S., uh, I believe, in a few places. And uh, southern Arizona is one of them. This is Cicalium. It's spelled with a P, if that makes any sense. Cicalium decompositum. And without flowers, you might not even guess it was a member of the sunflower family. There's the flowers right there. You see their discoid, prominent styles coming out. And there's the leaves. Basil rosetta leaves with a uh, pretty prominent flower stock. Now, I've seen these in Oaxaca. Not this species, of course. This is decompositum with those heavily dissected leaves. And with those leaves, uh, you would almost think that this was in the carrot family, APAC. It looks kind of like a ligustacum or a lamatium or some shit. But, uh, yeah, again, it's in the sunflower family. And I've seen... a. Uh, the, this genus uh, in uh, the cloud forests of Oaxaca at about 9,000 9, feet elevation. Uh, you know, kind of similar thing to what's going on here. Really hot lowlands and then uh, just uh, kind of a little sky island thing with conifers and, uh, you know, uh, somewhat uh, year-round moisture and what the shit. So uh, that species uh, had the same thing going on. You know, it's basal rosetta leaves and then a, a very tall flowering stalk. Some some call line leaves, you get some leaves on the stem, but not many. And uh, the, on that species, the, the basal rosette was huge. I mean, just gigantic, almost peltate leaves, like shield-shaped, very very wide and large. And then, uh, you know, I think that species had a purple adaxial surface. Pretty interesting. But let's look at the flowers. All right, so there you go. There's Cicalium decompositum flowers. Again, discoid flowers. Uh, it looks like they got a, a yellow anther column. It, the styles pop out of over there and uh, seem to have oh, just one series of phyleries, keeled phyleries. That is, they just like a prominent ridge, a prominent little ridge going on there. Keeled phyleries, uh, pretty wide, uh, heavily dissected corolla lobes, and then those styles are uh, somewhat prominent too, just poking out, looking like little bug antennas. And some of these, again, some of these cicalums can get very large. You know, they get, they get a, some can get a flowering stock upwards of 10 feet tall. See, there's a style with the anther column still on it, the yellow anther column. The shit are these guys doing? What are they doing? They're trying to get in there? Bunch of little guys pollinate these, it looks like. Anyway, there you go, cicalium decompositum. Pretty nice plant. Who's screaming up there? Sounds like a goddamn jay. I love the jays, though. Very obnoxious birds. 
I can relate. A nice uh, rhyolite palace piles everywhere. You know, about 8,300 feet up. You know, and there's just canyons, just basically canyons in this uh, uh, mass of volcanic rock on everywhere. And I was just admiring this wonderful oak species, which uh, you can see by those large leaves and uh, the larger stature of these oaks, that they seem relatively out of place, as most of the oaks here tend to have small leaves and it'd be kind of shrubby and not get very big. And then I was thinking, boy, there's oaks here. There's probably some nice mushrooms or something similar to that going on too, since uh, oaks are mycorrhizal and there's normally a lot of shit going on in the, under the ground uh, wherever you got oaks. And then sure enough, here's a beautiful Monotropa hypopotus. You can see right there, just a wonderful member of the uh, blueberry family, the monotropoid subfamily of the blueberry family, just the uh, stealing from the fungi on the ground. Again, that's mycoheterotrophy in action for you. It's pretty nice. It's pretty nice. Makes me feel a lot less homicidal. Oh, look at that. Look at those beautiful flowers. What is going on there? Huh? You know, and it, it's, uh, I guess they're somewhat ursulate. It's urn-shaped, basically, which is a trademark of uh, all the plants in a, the blueberry family. They got those urn-shaped flowers. Not all of them. Rhododendrons don't, but, uh, you know, vaccinium, uh, whether it's blueberries or cranberries, both in the genus vaccinium, they certainly have those ursulate flowers. Uh, Arbutus, manzanitas, galtheria. Oh, yeah, look at that. So nice. Such beautiful bright red color just popping up. And again, hey, these have almost entirely lost the genes to even produce chlorophyll. They just, they don't need them anymore. You know, if you look at the, you look at the genomes of these things, the, uh, the chloroplast genes are all over the place. There's the, no consistencies because they're just, the chloroplast genes can mutate since uh, it won't really affect the plant since it doesn't produce chlorophyll anyway. So they can get all, they, the, the chlorophyll genes basically become like a non-coding region, you know? So you get a lot of, they, they become uh, pretty variable. Anyway, look at this, uh, look at this stock in there too. Beautiful pigments. Beautiful anthocyanins and carotenoids and god damn. Looking through my monotropa. Oh yeah, see that? No chlorophyll at all. Ooh. Could look at it for hours. I could look at it for hours. Kind of glandular too. A little bit, a little bit frilly, huh? Look at those big ass bracts on the back of the flowers too, huh? Like on this guy, you know? It's so nice. Doesn't that make you feel good? Doesn't that make you feel better? Maybe all those crazy white boys that are going shooting up malls and shit, you know? If too bad they didn't know about botany, you know? Could just calm them right down, you know? Maybe they should have just studied plant science a little bit or some shit, you know? Because it really, it's like a, it's like the tissue paper that wipes the ass. You know, it gets rid of all the, the shit stain of modern society and civilization, huh? Because, you know, it's not a pretty world out there, folks, at least if you're looking at the human world. Kind of makes me want to die. But then you just go look at that, uh, something like that monotropa, you feel a little bit better, huh? You see, you got much more mesic forest over here, and then here you got a rhyolite palace slope, and you got a, what seems to be agave perii, certainly one of the agaves. It is producing pups, so that when, a, you know, the mother plant dies... You know, it's monocarpic, so they die after flowering. It just sends out other pups. And then, uh, I believe there's a, an endangered species of rattlesnake on these palace slopes. Maybe not on these, but uh, certainly in this region. Then you go a little bit farther up, and, uh, oh, what's that? Looks like a species of uh, Echinocereus up there. Woo! You know, combined with the altitude and the, uh, the steep slope, I am a... Uh, is that Quercus gambellii? What is it? I am a little bit winded and out of breath. But let's check out this uh, kind of series. Too bad it's not flowering. Look at that though. Multiple stems. Quite thick. What a beautiful plant. And then there's that goddamn mullen. Jesus Christ, there's no escaping. Oh yeah, nice humid montane forest. Oh yeah, look, it's a little species of orchid. Little species of malaxis. Look at it. There's another genus I uh, last seen in Oaxaca. A cloud forest in Oaxaca, much akin to this high elevation uh, cloud forest with lowlands that are just uh, scorchingly hot as balls. It's a very eloquent. You could put, you could write that down. You could write down a scorchingly, uh, 
scorchingly hot as balls. It's a very descriptive term. You can put that on the record. Oh, yeah. Look at it. They are orchid flowers. Look at those tiny little, tiny little flowers on that flower spike. Ooh. And of course, a typical monocotta perlovenation. And there's quite a few of them. It's just the morning in the Sky Island pine forest. You can hear all the Mexican jays going batshit. There's all kinds of birds, uh, woodpeckers, uh, especially uh, pounding on those uh, dead snags over there. But I want to take a minute and show you just a host of uh, mycorrhizal mushrooms going off. There's more of those amanitas. And then here's uh, one that uh, you could call relatively choice. This is uh, known as the porcini. This is a boletus edulis. I believe it's edulis. It's one of the edible boletes that, uh, it's, I mean... The most that the boletes are going to do if you get a bad one is they're just going to make you puke and uh, puke out your ass. You know, some of the uh, some of the species are not edible, but they're not deadly poisonous. None of the boletes are, as far as I know. And this one is actually choice. This is a boletus edulis, like I said, also known as the porcini. You go real nice with pasta. We ate some of these last night. Look at the stem, though. You could see that uh, kind of reticulate uh, thing going on with those... Just the texture of the stem right there. That's a good identifying factor for porcinis. And then, of course, once you get up there under that uh, under that cap, you could see... Oh, there's a little fly hanging out under there. Once you get up there under that cap, you could see uh, there's no gills, there's pores. And that's a big identifying factor for many of the uh, Boletaceae, uh, which are, again, all entirely mycorrhizal. But you got to be careful because there's a species called Satan's Bolete uh, that will, uh, it will make you puke. It'll make you... Uh, piss out your ass and uh, throw up all over the place but uh, these these guys are choice like i said they're very delicious and they're a uh, symbiotic uh, with the pines